Hi guys, my name is Aditya. I work for BrowserStack as a infrastructure lead and I also contribute to Fedora project as well as certain other open source utilities around. So today I'm going to talk about running containers. How many of you uh, actually know about uh, Docker? Right? So you guys know that, uh, you know, running Docker is cool, right? Okay, so now we are going to see certain things about uh, running this cool stuff. We are going to check out what the problem is when we talk about running cool stuff, why Project Atomic and its associates will help us and uh, if possible I will try to give up a short demo, right? Okay, so the problem is that now that we have figured out one tool to rule everything, we need a stable environment to run that one tool. Uh, we need to support automation because let's face it, containers are good, but like any other software, containers can go wrong, they can crash, they can not boot uh, as per your requirement. A lot of bad things can happen in that area. Uh, and now that you are managing containers, uh, you are managing the applications inside it, the idea of the entire exercise should be that, okay, you need to focus on containers, not on the host because containers are the thing, you know, cool stuff. Okay, so this is Project Atomic. So, uh, Chetan Bhagat very rightly said this about Project Atomic. Come on, dead audience. Okay, so, <laughs> J.R.R. Tolkien said this about the one ring. So who laughed late? Okay, so this is one project uh, which, this is kind of an umbrella project which uh, Red Hat and some of its associates like, uh, you know, uh, Fedora project and CentOS are trying to build up. Uh, what essentially we are doing is we are trying to uh, bring together a lot of projects who are present in the container ecosystem to, uh, you know, build better tools so that, you know, we can reduce our pain of uh, managing containers. So. The first component which I am going to introduce you to is the Atomic Host itself. Now, Atomic Host is a very minimal operating system. Uh, it's based out of the RPMs which are uh, coming from Red Hat Enterprise Linux or CentOS or uh, Fedora Linux. So basically, you get the same Red Hat, uh, Red Hat and CentOS and Fedora quality which you are already familiar with. Uh, it has robust Atomic upgrades and and uh, system D and rollback processes. Now with atomic upgrades, uh, you guys have heard of atomicity in the, in the nature of uh, databases, right? The transactions are atomic. How many of you have heard of this term that transactions are atomic in nature? Quite a few of you, yeah. So I'll take up on that. Uh, just know that right now we are uh, working towards a very robust atomic upgrade systems. Uh, we are using system D. Uh, which is which is to provide a lot of uh, you know initial booting up and managing of the system and and right now the atomic is in good enough state that it can be deployed easily on cloud cloud based environment like ec2 or openstack uh, it can be virtualized with any of the hypervisors like quemu and you can install it on bare metal as well uh, it includes rpm os3 how many of you have heard of rpm os3 Okay, okay. I'm sure you guys are uh, working with GNOME. Okay, right. So, uh, what RPM OS tree does is it gives you a bootable, immutable version file system trees. So, you guys have worked with Git a lot. Uh, you know that uh, all the files are versioned, right? So, we take Git and we add the concept of booting, uh, booting up that entire file system. So now your file system becomes versioned. You make a change to file system, you can revert it. Imagine that you can revert an entire operating system and you have some idea of what Docker, what Atomic is able to do. It's composed from standard RPM, that's something which we've already covered. Atomic upgrades and rollback means that, see, managing something which is data center, which isn't data center and production ready, you don't want anything to fail in between, right? You don't want your updates to stop in between, you don't want to, uh, you know, any partial updates, packages going bad. Project Atomic gives you a transaction-based upgrade. So if you, are if you are upgrading your OS, your entire OS will be upgraded or nothing at all. 
similar to what you get in database transaction systems, right? So when, when you swipe a card, the amount is deducted, either the full or nothing at all. There's no partial thing there. So that's what is happening with uh, operating system. Uh, to achieve this, uh, we have done a lot of immutation here. So by immutable, I mean to say that most of the file system is not writable. If you try to uh, build a binary and insert it in user bin or something like that, you won't be able to do that. It's all immutable, except for war and ETC. Everything is immutable. ETC because of course you need to configure stuff and war because you need to store something like your Docker uh, images or your home file somewhere. So these two are the only directories that are writable. Systemd, Systemd I'm sure a lot of you have heard a lot about it. Uh, just a brief introduction. Uh, it's a system and services manager for Linux. It has already uh, replaced the traditional NX system in CentOS 7 and Rail 7. Fedora is shipping it with uh, Systemd since quite a few releases now. Uh, it's highly modular. You can write modules for it for almost everything that an OS does and uh, plug it in. It'll, it's good to go. Uh, Systemd can, you know, uh, talking about Systemd can take like good R. So I suggest you guys go to 0.8.d, that's Leonard Pottering's website. Uh, he has extensive documentation on why to do this and what not. Okay, there's nothing about not, why to do this. And it also includes cockpit. So uh, if you guys have ever worked with Webmin, something like that, Webmin uh, from like few years ago, right, few of you. So, uh, so cockpit project uh, was developed independent in, I mean, it was independent of entire Docker ecosystem, but it somehow ended up uh, being shipping with uh, Project Atomic. What it does is that you can attach a lot of hosts to it and you can manage them. For example, uh, it'll give you, you know, pretty graphs about how, how much CPU you are actually using, how much RAM you are actually using. You can manage it in the sense that you can turn on and off the services. Uh, you can check out things like what all containers are running on your Project Atomic host. You can check out what all images you are you have available. You can download and run even more images. You can check out how much resources your containers are using, all from a pretty GUI perspective. So that helps a lot in you know visualizing how much uh, efficient your system is actually going to be. This is like just one of the graphs. You can see the combined CPU usage of one of the systems, memory usage, a few containers that I have here. I can actually drill down even more. I can click on the containers. It'll go there. It'll show me the utilization of container resources as well. Uh, all those things can be managed. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to introduce Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a project by Google. Uh, this is to manage the containers running. So uh, it helps in providing a very fault tolerant environment. So for example, if you have, uh, let's say that you, your, your container can handle X amount of traffic and usually you serve 10X of that. So ideally you would want at least 10 of those containers running in your infrastructure. But sometimes for unforeseeable reasons, the containers can go bad, right? They can crash or probably you can get massive spike or something like that. So in those cases, Kubernetes can help you very easily by scaling it up and be making it fault tolerant. So in case one of them crashes, Kubernetes will observe your environment. It will detect that one of them has crashed and it will start booting it up. And within no time, you will have your container back serving the traffic. So that helps the scalability cause a lot. You can create clusters of applications using Kubernetes. And uh, eventually you can scale out an entire uh, application cluster, including databases, including your web servers and everything using Kubernetes. Right? Uh, there are a lot of examples in, uh, with Google Cloud Platform repos. Uh, we can check out some very common examples about Nginx, WordPress, and all those things. Right. So. These are some of the main components. There are more. Project Atomic is a very young project at the moment, and you know every week or every month we get more and more tools added. Uh, latest would be Nullicule. Uh, Nullicule is a standard to make up these clusters, but let me not talk about it at the moment because it's just too hazy for now. But yeah, I think uh, going forward we'll have more of that. Starting an atomic host, you will need a cloud init server. 
cloud in its server. I mean, have you you guys must have been working with uh, something of AWS sort. So, have you guys uh, ever thought that when you supply your key, your uh, instance already has that? So, that entire process is taken care of by something called as cloud in it, similar to cloud in it. What cloud in it does is that you feed it initial data and it will take all that data and supply it to the host. So, for example, uh, certain things like instance ID, uh, IP addresses, your public, public IP addresses, uh, your keys, your users, they are all supplied to the instance by the cloud in it data. So, atomic host uh, also needs that. You can either run a cloud in it server or uh, if you are not in a state to run a cloud in it server, you can fake it. So, for smaller instances, uh, for smaller deploys, this is what I do. Uh, I basically shove metadata in a text file and then create an ISO and make the virtualizer, uh, make the virtualization tool behave as if that there is a cloud in it server running. Uh, this is the entire process. I am not going to demo this for now because this takes time. But, uh, but essentially what you are doing is you are supplying it uh, basic, uh, the basic things like what's the host name, what's the instance ID, your password, your keys and everything and uh, and then you are generating an ISO image out of it. These ISO, this ISO image will be mounted as a, as a disk on your uh, instance and the instance will read from there uh, thinking that it's actually reading from a cloud in it server. Right. Uh, so, this is a demo which I would want to do. Let's see. Mean, in the meantime, do you guys have any questions, anything? Yep, please. Uh, so, in the same space right now you have two other interesting projects is uh, Canonical's Ubuntu Snappy Core and um, the more pop most popular one in the space currently is Core OS. Right. Especially with Fleet, uh, etcd and Weave. So, what are the equivalents uh, for Atomic to run something like Fleet which is super because of the distributed system D thing? Uh, right. At the moment I don't think there has been any work done in that direction to bring fleet in Project Atomic. However, uh, Project Atomic is working with a lot of the people which you mentioned and uh, I think in near future you can expect Rocket to come to, uh, to be in a state to run with Project Atomic. But isn't the basis of Rocket uh, to get rid of uh, PID1 uh, having system D to spawn the Docker process? where they take the approach right. that so Docker would be your init process. Right. So, uh, that is the, that, that's why I said in some time. Uh, we are trying to sort those issues out. Uh, another thing which will come, so see Docker is one of the things that Project Atomic does. Rocket is definitely the next thing which we are looking forward to do. Uh, there will be systemd ns spawn as well, uh, yeah. which will also help in containers. Now, systemd ns spawn and Rocket, I mean, I know there is a direct conflict and collision, but uh, no, given that it's driven by Red Hat and Leonard Potaring, so yes, yes, it is. Uh, so th as I said, it's like an umbrella project to bring a lot of you know stray projects together. Uh, well, stray might not be the right word, but a lot of different projects who are working in same same space together. So that's what we are trying to do. So yeah, uh, Rocket, yes, HC, HCD is something which we already uh, are using with Kubernetes. So, HCD is already there. Uh, I think fleet, I'm not really sure about. Right. So, Kubernetes is what I'm, I'll try to demo right now. Uh, Kubernetes, uh, so what, what happens is that you can run your Kubernetes API server on, uh, on an atomic host or somewhere. Basically, your kubectl, a kubectl will run on the atomic host and kubectl is what what is is the tool which is going to run these docker containers for you so that's what the idea is uh, so so yeah. uh, in core os you have a toolbox where uh, you can mount a particular binary compiler like python or pip or any of the tools which automatically gets up one particular container in in ubuntu or fedora 
so this will eventually give us a command line uh, communication on the core os machine so is that uh, project atomic have anything like that where uh, because i don't see any package manager in project atomic where uh, you can install a particular thing and then just use it for some sort of an automation where you mount it through you know like let's take ansible have the same problem where core os you need to do it with toolbox and then install the docker based uh, plugin for that and then do an ansible uh, automation but in project atomic i don't see anything like that so is it any there? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't get it. Can you repeat that? Relies on the ambassador. Kubernetes relies on the ambassador pattern for HA and for distributed loads, where uh, you have something like Weave running in uh, CoreOS. So you have an L2 plane or an L3 plane hmm. on your entire fleet. So, right. Uh, okay. Let Let me answer him first. Uh, so his question was around uh, toolbox and CoreOS. Right. And so this. the philosophy of uh, Project Atomic is uh, is a bit different. The philosophy of Project Atomic is that technically you should never ever actually log in into the Atomic host. So modification of Atomic host, be it by a package manager or be it by any other means, is out of question. I mean, this is something which we don't want people to do. We don't want to want people Correct. to get into the host ever, ever, ever. Correct. I agree. It's a lightweighted OS. That's the reason you go for these kind of OS um, and, right. uh, to implement on top of Docker to make it much more lighter. Right. But when it comes to debugging these things, we need some sort of a tools where it at least give us a chance to debug and get the right. information back. So on the host. Uh, in, in those scenarios, I would refer you to uh, super privileged containers, SPC. What SPC does is that for example, if you have a bunch of containers who are not behaving very nicely, SPC, using SPC, you can uh, collect their uh, logs, collect certain data like SAR data or logging data. And using SPC, you can have all that information ready for you to debug. So, yeah. so with your uh, answer, it means to say that uh, uh, we can do some sort of a things, okay, but, but what if I want to do a configuration management through Ansible and uh, I want to do nothing is there? I, I uh, don't at least want, okay, the philosophy is that I don't want you to do that. If you want to use Ansible, you want to modify the host, then clearly you're looking at the wrong product. Then probably you should maybe go towards CentOS Core or CentOS Cloud offering or something like that. No, again, this Project Atomic is coming from the base of CentOS or Fedora, yes, right? Yes. So uh, if I can, when I do an update, if I install this particular uh, tools, uh, when I'm doing an upgrade, RSP, I mean, R, I mean RPM OS3 upgrade, so then I can install these tools and get the Ansible running, no? You cannot install, there is no concept of installing. Okay. The concept is that you can do atomic upgrade of already existing oh, okay. RPMs. What we do, what we can alternatively offer you is either a way to compose your own distribution, which is not very difficult. You can pick up CentOS's RPM, you can pick up Fedora's RPM, mm. you can compose your own read-only file system. The whole philosophy of making it read-only is that you should not be able to install arbitrary tools. If you want to install tools, if you are not very comfortable with this concept and you want tools like probably, you know, things that has to be modified and, you know, worked upon, then you are, I think you're looking at the wrong product altogether. You should, you should uh, explore more into CentOS core in that case, uh, CentOS main operating system. If you want a no, if you want a Im non immutable and you know if you want to install packages of your choice then yeah i think uh, atomic is not going to do that for you you have 5 more minutes do you want to take up more questions or do the demo uh, what do you want guys questions or demo demo we'll take demo and then questions may be outside <coughs> okay demo i'll make it very short Right, uh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah I'm, I'm increasing, I'm increasing. Do you see the font thing here? 
last one okay Goodness, this is difficult. Is there a command line to do that? Okay, right. Um, so Kubernetes work in a very classic master-slave architecture. There is a Kubernetes API server. You can think of it as master, and then there are kubelets. So kubelets are the ones which actually execute. They communicate to API server, get the data, what kind of uh, you know. Uh, containers they want and then you uh, and then they boot it accordingly so right now okay just go away right right now i have only one node with me uh, it's a virtual machine running on my system uh, what i want to do is i want to create a simple simple container which will just serve one image okay so uh, let me quickly do it Yep, I have it ready. It just serves one image over HTTP. Um, this is the standard definition. I mean, you can you can look it up on the Kubernetes repo. There are a lot of such examples out there. Right. So this is the pod which is already running. I have already started it, uh, and it is going to serve a static image. Which I'm going to show you here, right? So this is the image which is being served. Now, what I'm going to try to do here is I'm going to try to kill that container manually. As soon as I kill that container, uh, this image would vanish. Right, so I have just stopped, uh, stopped it, it will take a few seconds to stop. The image, once it's stopped, the image should vanish from here. And yeah, so the container is stopped. Image is no longer there. Now this is a very generic scenario. This is a very true production-like scenario where your container can crash. Now, as soon as your container crashes, Kubernetes is supposed to detect that and bring it back. So I stopped the container, I'll show you again what happened. If you see, my container is back here. Right, so this is how kubectl work. Very short demo. Uh, if you want detailed code or something, catch me outside or tomorrow at Cloud BOF. I can explain it in more details. Now, do you have any questions? Now I can take up. I think I have a couple of minutes more. No. Time's okay. up. Okay, we are done. Thank awesome. you, Aditya. Thank you.